today I'm at the Grand Army of the Republic Museum in downtown Eaton Rapids and I'm about ready to tour the museum tonight and take part in listening to a lecture they're holding here. So come along and join me. I'll see how much I can uh, film inside. I don't know if they'll let me film the lecture, but I'm going to try to film uh, inside of the museum and show you some of the history here. So come along. Now this museum is a Grand Army of the Republic Memorial Hall and Museum. So I thought it would be best to start with explaining what the Grand Army of the Republic is and some of their history. In early 1866, the United States of America, now a secure nation again after the Civil War, was awaking to the reality of the recovery from war. And this had been a much more different war than the country had ever been through. In previous conflicts, the care of the veteran warrior was the province of the family or the community. Soldiers then were friends, relatives, and neighbors who went off to fight until the next planting or harvest. It was a community adventure and their fighting unit had sort of a community flavor. By the end of the Civil War, these units had become less homogenous. Men from different communities and even different states had been forced together by the exigencies of battle and there were now new friendships and lasting trusts that had been forged on the battlefield. And with the advances in the care and the movement of the wounded, many who would have surely died in earlier wars returned home to be cared for by the community. And there were many that were recovering from wounds or living with the effects of their wounds, including those among them that were amputees. But they now also faced many other needs, needs of widows and orphans. Veterans needed jobs, including a whole new group of veterans, the colored soldier and his entirely new freed family. It was often more than the fragile fabric of communities could bear. State and federal leaders from President Lincoln down had promised to care for those who had borne the burden, his widows and orphans, but they had little knowledge of how to accomplish the task. There was also little political pressure to see that the promises were kept. For those who were fortunate enough to return home, many emotions were experienced from happiness to guilt for having survived the war. However, probably the most profound emotions experience was that of the emptiness. Men who had lived together, fought together, foraged together, and survived had developed a unique bond that could not be broken. As time went by, memories of the filthy and vile environment of camp life began to be remembered less harshly and eventually more fondly. The horrors and the gore of the battlefield with the smoke and the smell of black powder were replaced with the tears for the departed comrades. Friendships forged in battle survived the separation and the veterans missed the warmth of trusting companionship. With that as a background, groups of men began joining together, first for camaraderie and then for political power. Emerging as the most powerful group among these gatherings was a veterans organization that came into existence that would be called the Grand Army of the Republic, G-A-R, which by 1890 would number over 400,000 veterans of the War of the Rebellion. The GAR was officially founded in Decatur, Illinois on April 6, 1866 by Benjamin F. Stevenson. Its membership was limited to honorably discharged veterans of the Union Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and the Revenue Cutter Service, forerunner to the Coast Guard, who had served between April 12, 1861 and April 9, 1865. The community level level organizations were called posts and each were numbered consecutively within each state, which were called departments. Most posts also had a name, and the rules for their naming included the requirement that the honored person be deceased and that no two posts within the same department could have the same name. The departments consisted of the local posts within the state and at the national level, and the organization was operated by the elected camaraderie-in-chief. So the official body over the years held annual encampments they elected department commanders, seniors, junior vice commanders, and a local council. And the encampments were elaborate multi-day events, which often included camping out, formal dinners, and memorial events. National encampments of the GAR were presided over by the commander-in-chief, who was elected in political events, which rivaled national political party conventions. During the 90-year existence of the GAR, 
over 10,000 local GAR posts were created, including seven GR posts in foreign countries, five in Canada, one in Mexico City, and one in Peru. National encampments were very large, sometimes bringing in between 20,000 to 30,000 veterans to the host city for the entire week. Early during the existence of the GAR, United States presidents often attended and spoke to the membership. Although designed to be nonpartisan, the GAR became quite influential in terms of national and state politics and legislative matters. Five GAR members were elected president of the United States, Grant Hayes, Garfield, Harrison, and McKinley. And for a time, it was impossible to be nominated on the Republican ticket without the endorsement of the GAR voting bloc. Within state government, the GAR were even more influential. The GAR founded soldiers' homes and were often in relief work and in pension legislation. And this last point about the pension legislation, they made pioneer roads into equality by making sure that the colored soldiers also got pensions, which was something that probably had been unheard of in earlier times. But the GAR was a brotherhood. Many of the posts were very integrated, um, and it was based on where they live. And this is information that I got from my visit to the GAR Museum at the time when I filmed this video. So they were quite um, ahead of their time in terms of integration, and it was largely due to the soldiers themselves and the respect that they had for each other that made this possible. In later years, the GAR was also instrumental in helping to establish the Spanish-American War veterans, the American Legion, and the veterans of foreign wars. In fact, these organizations in their infancy often met in conjunction with the GAR. The GAR also encouraged the formation of allied orders to aid them in their various works. Numerous male organizations were formed, including the Sons of Veterans, the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War, and there were also women's organizations organizations like the Women's Relief Corps and the Ladies of the Grand Army of the Republic. Those are just a few examples. So the GAR organization lasted for roughly 90 years. The final encampment of the Grand Army of the Republic was held in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1949, and the last member, Albert Wilson, died in 1956 at the age of 109 years. So the Grand Army of the Republic Museum in Eaton Rapids is the only one that is strictly dedicated to the GAR history in the state of Michigan. And this was the original GAR Memorial Hall where they formed in Eaton Rapids. It is the former post of the James B. Bernard Post, number 111, Grand Army of the Republic Hall. Due to its location in downtown Eaton Rapids, its designation is in a historic district and the building is is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and Houses. Currently, there's over 5,000 historical artifacts and records relating to the Grand Army of the Republic and its allied orders on display at the museum. All of the historical artifacts and records have been donated or loaned to Michigan's GAR Memorial Hall and Museum for the purpose of fostering the memory and preserving the history of the GAR in the original historic setting. And what's fascinating about this museum is that it does have some Civil War artifacts, but the purpose and mission of the organization is to bring an informative and educational exposure to the history of the post-Civil War era with the Grand Army of the Republic within the state of Michigan. The building itself is an Italianate two-storied red brick structure, which originally had a balcony. Above the second story windows and door is a recessed brick area with the letters G-A-R. The building's in interior floor plan is simple with the first floor originally having been largely open and at the time it was originally rented out to merchants to financially support the GAR. It served as a meeting room and the parlor which occasionally served as the post ante room occupied the second floor. Now being that I visited the museum um, in the evening I did not get a chance to go visit the Grand River Island Park but not very far from this building is an island in the Grand River there in Eaton 
Rapids, and it is the GAR Island Park. And on the island, there are uh, cannons and other plaques, and they used to hold annual encampments, which were discontinued in 1929 due to too few veterans left to carry it on. In keeping with the historical significance, the museum holds a day-long Civil War discovery camp on GAR Island Park each year for children 8 to 14 years of age. And of course, like I mentioned before, there are two Civil War era cannons, 30 pounders and a 100 pounder, and they are on loan from the U.S. government to the Brainard Post, and they kind of serve as the silent sentinels in tribute to those who served in the American Civil War. So Michigan's GAR Memorial Hall and Museum is the only such museum in the state that is exclusively dedicated to ensuring that the memory, accomplishments, and the humanitarian contributions of the Grand Army of the Republic and its members in Michigan are not forgotten. So I'm going to include the link to their website in this video's description so that you guys can check it out and schedule a visit, maybe even make a contribution to this museum. It is a fascinating place to visit. I attended a lecture that evening on the Michigan First Colored Regiment, which later merged together to become the 102nd U.S. Colored Regiment. The whole history of that was tremendously fascinating, and I intend to do some uh, podcasts on that information in later episodes on my podcast. So be sure to check out my podcast and start listening to it, because there's a lot of material that I won't always be able to put into video format, but I'm going to try to get this information out in a podcast form. And in closing, I should mention that the building is located at 224 South Main Street in Eaton Rapids, Michigan, and it was constructed in 1886. It's quite an amazing historic landmark, and when you go inside, you really get a feel of the flavor of the history of not only this organization, but the impact of the Civil War, and it's really an amazing tribute to the Grand Army of the Republic and the men that served in the American Civil War. So definitely put it on your list to, to visit whenever you get a chance. Fabulous evening here at the GAR. Had a wonderful presentation about the Michigan 102nd. I'm certainly going to have a lot of information to share in my future uh, podcast and uh, perhaps a video on this. So if you like today's video, um, please take a minute to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.